Большое спасибо, что вы сегодня пришли. Очень много людей. Меня зовут Мария Макартычева. Я директор образовательной программы фонда VC. И очень рада представить вам сегодня Окви, который собственно, в представлении нуждается. Вы все знаете, кто это такой. Я хочу сказать, что, конечно, эта встреча сегодня не была бы возможна без гостеприимства Пушкинского музея и энтузиазма Марины Деловны Лошак. И это продолжение уже наших э, взаимоотношений, которое началось летом, в июле, когда проходила здесь наша ежегодная кураторская летняя школа. Э, у меня есть к Окве несколько вопросов. Надеюсь, что у вас тоже. И приглашаю вас э, после нашей беседы их задать. So, okay. Thank you for accepting our invitation to come to Moscow. Um, I know it's your first time here, and I hope you are having good impressions so far. Um, so um, today we know you as the director of uh, Haus der Kunstmuseum in Munich, and you were the artistic director of Documenta 11, and you are the curator of the upcoming 56 Venice Biennale. So these all are well-known and glorious facts of the career that you've taken in the arts. And I'm wondering, do you personally draw the difference between your media biography and the personal biography? Uh, or does it coincide? Well, you know, first, thank you so much for um, sharing the stage with me. And um, I would like to begin by thanking VAC for inviting me to Moscow, making it possible um, for me to, for the very first time to come to Russia, something I'm not very proud of. Um, I wanted you to keep it very low key that I had ne never been to, to Moscow. But nevertheless, I think um, it's really quite um, an extraordinary opportunity to come here and to have the um, opportunity to meet so many new faces and to engage in this conversation. I mean, to your point about the um, conjunction of my personal biography and my professional biography, um, I think that it's, it's very obvious that there is a conjunction, even if that conjunction might be tangential to some degree. But I prefer to speak about my intellectual biography, my intellectual biography um, and its relationship to my professional work. Let me begin first by saying that as a director of a museum, um, I tend to sort of to make the point to underscore the fact that being the director is my job, being a curator is my practice. And this is very important because the bureaucratic and administrative you know, side of building a career, um, you know, tends to sometimes obscure this other larger, more nuanced, more, um, shall we say, uh, cultural uh, constellation that forms what an intellectual biography could be. And for this, I think that it's important um, that when one steps into the arena of making an exhibition like Documenta 11, or making an exhibition like Venice Biennale, uh, two exhibitions that are quite similar, but are quite distinct in terms of their trajectories, in terms of their own um, you know, intellectual relationship to the field in which they're examining. So I will say in this sense that the conjunction of the two, of my personal biography and my intellectual biography, has to do with the way in which I believe that the space of curating represents a space in which one can act. And it is not just simply a question of arranging images and objects and similar and dissimilar um, strategies in one space, but it's a space in which that one takes up the challenge of the cultural you know, relationship 
of an exhibition to its very context, to its very historical condition. And this, for me, is very important in any exhibition that you undertake to, to make, that the, the space of the history of the exhibition is very important. And I think that for Venice Biennale, this is no less the case. And uh, the reason why I've chosen to make an exhibition that has no theme, but that can be read or scanned as a series of filters uh, against which one can uh, you know, suggest or perform an archaeology, if you will, of the conditions of um, the, the ground of the, of the Venice Biennale. There are three filters that have indicated. The first one is called Garden of Disorder, and the Garden of Disorder uh, you know, takes up the space of the Giardini in Venice as a historical problematic to analyze. And so when we look at that analysis, the conjunction of the personal and the public, the personal and the professional, the intellectual and the cultural, immediately begin to sort of to present um, incredible opportunities of, of, uh, of curatorial analysis. This second filter is called um, uh, liveness on epic duration. And here I'm particularly interested in the possibility of the conjunction of the time and space of the exhibition. So it's not only a question of dealing with space, but the temporality of the given works in the exhibition to exhaust, if you will, the capacity of the space to be able to incubate, to hold the time of the exhibition, to exhaust it. And in, in, in fact, to fail in our ability to try to exhaust that. You know, the, the last one is called capital, the last filter. And of course, um, I have to be very, very careful of talking about capital in the epicenter of the critique of capital itself. And, but I think that this is really something that, um, that one has to sort of to look at the challenges that exhibitions face today and how one may be able to deal with this. So I've sort of enumerated, if you will, the, the kind of lapidary fashion that governs my own thinking when I begin to formulate an exhibition and um, how my own intellectual biography plays into that. Thank you. And with this uh, historical approach, um, the role of Venice Biennale has been changing. And so what do you think, uh, what is your attitude to, towards its role now and uh, towards the other big international exhibitions like that? Um, because it's, it's, a, it's an inevitable part of the global art system. And uh, this art system has been criticized a lot. So are you, what is your attitude towards the, the whole art system and to, to you being a part of it? You know, well, um, let, let me say first and foremost that what makes Venice Biennale entirely unique and distinct is, is fundamental anachronism. I mean, I think it is the only Biennale in the world that still retains its 19th century model. And that model was the subject of very serious fundamental critique when I was um, you know, emerging as a curator in the late 80s, early 90s. The, the, the idea that the nation state as such has a role to play in the formulation of an artistic space. And I very well remember the very first act I undertook when I was appointed the artistic director of Johannesburg Biennale in 1996 was to abolish the national pavilions that the Johannesburg Biennale had borrowed because everybody thought that was the model to emulate. So there was this dimension of emulation and that Venice remained this kind of grand um, you know, project that required you know, all forms of mimicry. Today is the only one that survives. 
So I don't think it's changing in that sense. But I think what makes it interesting today for us as a kind of historical space is that the very problem of the nation state can be properly examined and seen from this anachronism of Venice. And I think that's what makes it, for me, fundamentally very interesting, you know, to cast one's work against the backdrop of the changing context of the national formations that you find in the Giardini. So Venice provides an, a laboratory of sorts, of thinking, and it provides a laboratory of curatorial imagination. And even, but, yet, but you're quite correct that even within the institution itself, the role of the central pavilion has changed. The, the central pavilion be, be, you know, began life as you know, a kind of international pavilion, then changed to an Italian pavilion, and is back again to being the central pavilion. So this constant mutation of the givings or the, you know, the kind of the outlines of each space is for me something that is really very important to reflect on when you make an exhibition like Venice. Now to the point about the art system. Um, it depends on what you call the art system. I think um, uh, we were having this conversation earlier this afternoon. And I've tried to draw a distinction because we tend to say the art world. And I've you know, tried to draw a distinction between the art world and the art system. I said, there is no art world. There are art worlds. But there is an art system that mediates the relationship between these series of worlds. The art world in, in Moscow, the art world in St. Petersburg, or in Helsinki, or in, or in Dakar, Senegal, or in Beijing. You know, so they, they have really multiple temporalities. But it is the art system in the complexity of the art system that we can begin to really be able to visualize the constellation that make up these art worlds, right? And I am, you know, not particularly um, uh, opposed to the art system. I work in it. I'm one, one of the last people who go out there critiquing Biennales, you know, I've... Um, you know, it's been a constant source of employment for me, you know, <laughs> in that sense. I've, you know, with Venice Biennale, this will be the ninth one I've, you know, been able to make in different parts of the world. But each of these Biennales are all very different. And I will also argue that most of Biennales are oftentimes compensatory. They do not have the scale, they do not have the resources to be these mega shows that we oftentimes you know, project onto them. They are really not that, you know. So, and I think that Biennales have also played a very significant role in opening up this network of relationships between artists. And I think that if you look in the, I would say towards the end of the 80s, that we were still in the period where you can talk about, you know, the, the relationship between Biennales and the artists as migrants. And in the 90s, you know, and of course, Akili Bonito Oliver's 1993 biennial on nomadism, you know, exemplified another shift, and this is the shift towards, you know, the artist, the, you know, as traveler. And this had to do with the changing geopolitical conditions of the 90s. And of course, today, the landscape, I would say, really belongs to the pilgrims, the audience who is coming from so many different parts of the world and therefore complicating the geography, if you will, of Biennales. And I think you can witness this in Venice very much. And, and I believe that this is what makes for me uh, Venice Biennale you know, quite an interesting and, and rich compost of of ideas to work with. Um, with this issue of nomadism and um, with this distinction between the art worlds and the art system, it's um, interesting to know the distinction between local and international. Do you think, in a way, we can call the art system a synonym of international and art worlds synonym of local? Because actually, uh, Moscow, as many other cities, uh, tr uh, considers 
tends to consider itself international. Mm. And um, what, what does this mean in your opinion? And uh, what do you think, what is it that makes the art scene of a city international? Mm. I mean, I think it's a very complicated question that you ask and, and one that does not really have an easy answer. Um, it does not have an easy answer, but I think it's one that is worth examining, you know, because this distinction or this tension that you've, you know, posed, that the art walls tend to be the one that is local and the art system is the one that seems to be international. And it's a, it's a very valuable distinction simply because, you know, locality means something. I think it's important to think about locality because locality can also provide new spaces of resistance, if you will, towards a kind of homogenization of, you know, the critical strategies that artists take up. Some of the artists I've met in the last, you know, less than 24 hours that I've been here, um, have already, they're already showing me very clearly how much locality means and how from that locality one can project to the global or international you know, scene. The research that the artists are undertaking here, um, whether it's looking at it you know, in detail as Soviet modernism or looking at the new conditions of migrancy, internal migrancy, you know, that this internal migrancy that also comes out of the history of contiguous colonialism or contiguous imperialism in this particular context. It's a very enriching fact when we think about the debates about migrancy and ethnicity and the, you know, the politics, if you will, of ethnicity, some of the things that I was formed under in the 80s in the United States or even in, in England. And you know, in 1994, there was a big conference at the then Tate Gallery called a new internationalism. And this conference was mostly populated by curators and, and critics who came, as it were, from what people might consider the elsewhere. It was people like Hu Han Ru, who was, you know, had just arrived in Europe. It was Gita Kapoor. It was you know, Olu Ogwibe and you know, it, this diversity of, of peoples. And so in this so-called international context was a gathering of lo you know, local art worlds. And I think that what that conference you know, proposed is the challenge of thinking the global today. And that challenge is something that we're still you know, uh, you know, working through and around. So when, but I don't necessarily want to sort of to see the local and the global in opposition, because I think that would be too simplistic. You know, and this opposition, you know, based on you know the the values of authenticity, that would be a false value. Um, but nevertheless, I think that you know currently, um, what what I what I tend to see in that is the framework of the so-called global art world is what I will call uh, that is predicated on the idea of off centers. Because in the past, we tended to deal with the center and the periphery. There are no more peripheries anymore. You know, and there really isn't fundamentally a center as such. This is you know, an admitted way. You know, this would have been you know, correct during the Cold War. And I think so we in the artistic field and in, in the curatorial field, we have to sweep away these you know, oppositional distinctions between the local and the global, between the periphery and the center. So what we have really have is this idea of the off-centers. So that, um, and these create new, you know, forms of magnetism and they kind of become almost kind of, um, you know, renders the entire, you know, sphere of the international artistic landscape in a prismatic fashion. And this I very much appreciate so that when I go to Buenos Aires, uh, it's a very, very distinctive, you know, you know, world that I'm looking at. But I just want to add one thing in terms of the idea of the international. That one might think the international not so much as uh, a geopolitical condition, but to think of the international within the context of contemporary art as a code, as a 
as a code of translation. And this code of translation, I believe, I think that the international is to be understood through the question of translation. And you know, when I see in VAC's office the work of a young artist, you know, works made in, in, in Moscow, but obviously made for consumption beyond Moscow, written in English, you know? So that is really a code. Not so much the language itself, but a, you know, it's a code of reading. And so I'm interested in this you know, multiplicity of codes that enable us to be able to understand what is going on in Moscow, to enable us to read what is going on in London, that enables us to see you know, clearly you know, how one might think the pictorial um, you know, uh, you know, conventions that I imagine in Beijing. Yeah, this is uh, this is very interesting because actually what I was thinking when you were answering the previous question is that um, as a poet and as a writer, you probably uh, I I assume that you might be used to uh, understanding culture through text, and uh, Russian culture is uh, quite logocentric, and uh, it is um, it is also widely known that uh, poetry is something that you may call untranslatable. So I'm wondering, is it, uh, is it possible to mu multiply these codes? And is it, is it possible to uh, use these codes without losing, without reducing the meaning in translation from different cultures, and especially from cultures that uh, tend to, to focus on text? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, it's not only language sometimes that is resistant to translation. I mean, I think there are also iconographic conventions that are resistant to easy translation. And I think this is what adds to the layer of complexity in terms of how we think about works of art. And, uh, um, and, and I, but I, I, do, I do agree with you, um, you know, that this... You know, um, you know, both the logocentrism and iconophilia of the present moment, you know, are two interesting ways in which sort of to think, um, you know, the field of of, of culture. And uh, and and uh, and in, in, uh, I'm I'm very very much, you know, um, in you know, sometimes confounded, you know, by you know, certain conventions that one might read in, you know, um, say, um, I don't want to generalize, let me, not, let me be very careful here, a certain type of dark humor that one can sometimes find in Eastern European contemporary, you know, are the use of humor. And that humor itself is really in the realm of the untranslatable. Yeah, and I think for me this is a challenge, and I think that's what makes the complexity of looking at contemporary art in these particular moments very interesting. And I think, and the, and the humor itself is also a form of resistance, a form of of critique, a form of really building new layers of meaning in what we do. And I think um, that is, um, you know, one thing that I believe that makes the opening up of you know, the broader field of contemporary art is very, you know, um, you know uh, I'm not as pessimistic as some people might be. Everything has not been taken over by the market, uh, in, regardless of popular, <laughs> you know, um, in, uh, in, everything is not Jeff Koons, I mean, you know, with all due respect. It's not all about the, the market. There are still so many different areas of thinking that is very important. If you look at the Middle East, for example, where I've made you know um, an, a project, you know, several four five years ago, you know, walking at, you know you know working across different cities: Beirut, Damascus, Amman, uh, Tunis, and so on. What struck me, what was very very interesting, is that when you talk about the idea of the public sphere, 
It is a completely an alien language. It's a language that you can say is an academic language, but because m many of the you know the, you know of the of the spaces of thinking in, do, in, that, in those parts of the world are really about the civic, the attempt to construct the realm of the civic. And I think this distinction between the public sphere and the civic is a very interesting one to pursue in this particular way. That's just one, you know, two examples that I can offer in terms of sort of reading the landscape of contemporary art as you move you know, through different parts of the world. Um, I have uh, another question that I think uh, everyone is interested in related to the current... To, to the, the, the list of artists? To the... <laughs> I think everyone would ask this question as well, uh, related to the political situation, actually. And um, this is something uh, that I'm wondering if, uh, if, you, if your own political views can affect your decisions as a curator and can, can the political situation, a global political situation, how, how does it affect your choice with Venice Biennale, with other exhibitions, and just in general, with your strategy, curatorial, curatorial practice? Wow, you're trying to get me in trouble here. <laughs> um, well, I, I, you know, I, I, I want to be clear, you know, my exhibitions do not necessarily reflect my politics in that, in that sense, but they do reflect my interest in in the relationship between an exhibition, not art, an exhibition, because what I make are exhibitions and they have very specific political, cultural, and economic context in which they exist. So one cannot go into making an exhibition like Documenta with the huge resources it has and ignore the, this, some of these conditions, right? Um, but I am indeed alert to the importance of the discursive in the exhibitions that I formulate to give ground to artists to be able to do more than just simply present us with the latest things that they've done, but to work with artists as thinkers, to work within the analytical systems that the artists you know, bring to the exhibition. So I'll give you an example in, the, in terms of the political context, of course. When I was appointed artistic director of Documenta in 1998, I remember this, you know, as a moment of transition, of change, the anticipation. Everybody remembers, do you all remember what was then called Y2K? You know, this impending shift of the, the millennial anxiety of Y2K. I remember this particular moment, but that, you know, but it was also a moment that was both rich with possibilities, but would very soon darken in Europe the rise of, you know, of the extreme right parties in European countries and the changes that were occurring. So my idea of the platforms in Documenta um, emerged not as my initial proposal. It was my proposal was to do things around the world. But the, you know, the idea of the platforms emerged um, you know, quite accidentally, standing in the local train station in Castle. And there as a series of platforms and the trains we are coming and going. But what made the local train station interesting that it was at once a terminal and a terminus. It was the end of the line and the beginning of the journey at the same time. This for me reflected what I wanted to enact with Documenta. And that was immediately, it was like this, wow. I mean, it was the, the most prosaic thing, right? But, but it had a fundamental um, way of transforming my thinking that how could we stage Documenta in the 21st century? That Because I believe there were three different periods of Documenta. The first were the Arnold Bordiers 
Anobode was the founder of Documenta, the post-war Documenta from 55 to 68. By 68, you know, something had happened in Europe, around the world, that completely transformed, you know, the way in which younger people, the younger generation thought about, you know, culture. And Bode, for the all intents and purposes, he wasn't born in the 19th century, but he was, you know, coming from at, around that period. Then the second period for me began with Harold Zeman in 1972. And I thought that from that period to, to the to Catherine Davis document in 1997, I considered this kind of, what I would say, the first time you had the emergence of the subjectivity of the curator in the exhibition. There were, you know, the, the work of the curator as author. This was very, very important. It was very sharp. And this documenter um, from Zeman in 72 was also the moment of kind of an interdisciplinary explosion of the exhibition form. It was very innovative. It was very interesting. It, it created all kinds of alliances between different artistic projects. But it was also a documenter, you know, predicated on a generation of artists. This was really entirely unique in this sense. And, you know, Catherine Davis' documenta struck me as the conclusion, if you will, of a certain idea of the new avant-garde. And so, therefore, Catherine prepared the ground for Documenta 11. And I said this, that regardless of who did Documenta 11, it was going to be the third period. And here I had a chance to take the mantle of making the first documenter in the 21st century. And I was very clear that it had to be a global exhibition. But in order to make it a global exhibition, one had to deterritorialize you know, Castle. One had to bring, make Castle one of the many places where important thought and thinking could happen. So if you call this a politic, then it has the you know, the ground of the political in the sense that he wanted to challenge the very conditions of producing the exhibition, but also to challenge its itineraries. So I wanted to make the first platform in Europe, and I wanted to make it in the German-speaking world, but I did not want to make it in Kassel. So we chose Vienna. And luckily, Jörg Haider had come to power. So the first platform, Democracy Unrealized, was very clear, was an, you know, a way to sort of, to, you know, to raise particular types of questions. And then the second platform um, in New Delhi, Experiments with Truth, which was a response to Gandhi's autobiography, My Experiments with Truth, uh, you know, occurred in May 2001. And... The first platform had two parts, Vienna and Berlin. And Berlin was going to be in October. Then 9-11 happened. So we were, in a sense, caught up in these thing, you know, the changes that we couldn't ignore. And that was the reason why this has happened. Now, let me speak very quickly about Venice and that we are again in this incredible moment of uncertainty and instability. And... I want to make an exhibition not necessarily only of art. I want to, under, to make a cultural manifestation. That is what Venice Biennale is going to be. Okay, thank you. So what are going to be the artists? <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned. I'm very sure they are floating around the web right now. <laughs> because, you know, some artists and some galleries can't help themselves, but, you know... If you're patient enough, March 5th. <laughs> okay. Um, now I think I'm going to let the audience ask the questions because there are so many of us today and uh, I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Да, меня зовут Анатолий Осмоловский, я художник. Я хочу задать такой достаточно сложный вопрос. Вообще, 11 я документа для России была известна тем, что там не принимал э, участие ни один русский художник. 
При этом, надо сказать, что эта документа была заявлена как диалог культур. Ну, по крайней мере, я помню в каталоге вот эта идея платформ, она как бы э, позиционировалась как диалог культур, как э, диалог между разными культурами в мире, там Индия была перечислена и так далее. Но России вообще в этом диалоге вообще не было. И надо сказать, что очень важно это накладывалось на то, что и на десятый документе Катрин Давид тоже не участвовал ни один русский художник. Поэтому здесь у нас в России возникл такой чудовищный синдром. Да, то есть э, огромное количество художников, кураторов, э, безусловно, э, переживали вот это неучастие как какое-то... Ну, э, какую-то ну, незрелость, я не знаю, или какую-то неполноценность местного художественного контекста. И самым загадочным образом, э, собственно, 90-е годы, когда не принимали участие русские художники, здесь в политическом контексте у нас был такой либерализм, фактически переходящий в абсолютную анархию. А, и не знаю, как это, может быть, совпало, может быть, это случайное совпадение, но как только Россия стала показывать свои э, длинные зубы и длинные когти, да, ну, так сказать, вот здесь в данном случае э, метафора медведя, да, так сказать, которая постоянно связывается с Россией, достаточно вполне уместна, хотя, безусловно, банально. Так сразу э, стали э, русские художники появляться на тех или иных выставках. И я вам хочу задать вопрос, и даже не вопрос, а э, это скорее, э, скорее некоторое, э, как бы вы рассудили, потому что внутри художественного нашего контекста существует спор между разными художниками. Одни художники говорят о том, что э, вот это движение агрессивное и, безусловно, отвратительное, на мой взгляд, движение России, которое сейчас присутствует, это правильно, да, потому что, собственно, в политическом контексте Россия должна занимать вот это, так сказать, такое место, да, место, которое, в общем, ну, всегда Россия, наверное, и занимала в историческом контексте. А другие говорят, что это, ну, как бы чудовищная катастрофа, и, в общем, это, в общем, невозможно. Так вот, как вы все-таки рассудили бы этот спор, да, Действительно ли агрессивность России и ее участие в международной художественной жизни взаимосвязанные вещи? Или э, это вещи не взаимосвязаны, это просто случайное такое сечение э, так сказать, обстоятельств, что в 90-е годы русские не участвовали, и Россия как бы в, в международной жизни не, практически не участвовала. А вот сейчас в нулевые, и вот уже в десятые она стала участвовать, и как бы русские художники тоже стали участвовать. Вот здесь есть какое-то взаимодействие или это случайное совпадение? About the participation or the non-participation of Russian artists, I think you're absolutely correct in terms of Documenta 10 and Documenta 11. Um, I remember maybe one, but these might not be considered Russian artists because they live in New York. <laughs> so um, I, I mustn't go into the game of numbers. But I did ask this question, I think it was to Katerina last night, and whether, you know, from the point of view of curators like myself and my colleagues in, you know, Western Europe, not everyone, because there is a very also active, you know, um, scene in which Russian artists appear all the time, everywhere. But I do ask myself whether, you know, the current context of what's going on around the world in which, you know, Russia is a strong protagonist, obviously Russia is a strong state, if there might not be, if, if there is, if, if there might be such a thing as Russophobia, you know, I mean, I don't know what that might be, 
that is unconscious, you know, unconscious in which, in which, in which we collapse the state with the cultural scene. I don't know. And, that, and because it makes it easy to look at Russia only historically, you know. So we love dissident art because it speaks perhaps, unconsciously perhaps, to the possibility of this Russophobia. I'm not saying it exists. It's just a, you know, a little warm going around in my head. And, and of course, my being here so late before the opening of Venice Biennale is also in itself one of the problems. So you are actually raising a very serious issue. Is it possible that an exhibition of international global significance can be organized and the curator does not visit the United States. And I think this is a question that I, as a curator, I have to take responsibility for my showing up in Russia late. You know, because it's not possible to organize an exhibition of global significance without visiting one of the most important countries in the world, which is Russia. I think we, so we, we do have a lot of work to do. We have questions to ask ourselves. But nevertheless, I think, you know, one must not um, also absolve the Russian scene <laughs> from, you know, the lack of engagement. I think there have been a, quite a number of things that have happened here that are very productive and are beginning to happen. So I do anticipate you know, the possibility of a change. But I, my relationship to, say, coming to Russia, I'm very, very careful that it's not, how shall I put it, that it doesn't turn into bounty hunting, you know? And, uh, and I want to come back in an engaged way to really you know, be much more attentive to the possibility that there could be these kind of collaborations and exchanges. So, um, you know, Russia's unwieldy, you know, gate, as it were, in the world, you know, the Russian bear, <laughs> they call it. Um, you know, it's something that we have to really ask ourselves, you know, whether that has, you know, produced a Russophobia in this sense. So there are great Russian art exhibitions, the, you know, um, Malevich, or, you know, so it's historical. It's overly historicized. It's how can we join the historical with the contemporary? I think that's a challenge. I don't know if I answered your question or if I evaded it, but nevertheless, that's my take on it. <laughs> Thank you for your wonderful lecture. I have a question. Uh, you argued about this uh, exodus from the logic between center and periphery. Uh, but today, if we imagine an art system as a network and different locations as nodes in this network, uh, there are really some centers like Kassel or Venice or Sao Paulo, uh, when, uh, which uh, attract uh, much more public uh, to view the shows in this uh, in these nodes in these cities. And uh, what will be in the idealistic scenario uh, where uh, there would be no center and periphery? Uh, thus, uh, all the nodes of the network will be equally important and attract equally uh, amount of people. Uh, so what will be with the public, with this pilgrim public, which travel between different important nodes? They would be dissolved or maybe some form of transform or what you'd think about? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you are pointing to something that uh, on the face of it, you know, is, um, you know, clearly, in, you know, sensible. But I would argue, um, you know, Castle is it, you know, is only a temporary center. 
because you have to see Castle after the day after the last day of Documenta. No. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. <laughs> it is not a pretty sight. There's an incredible deflation, you know. And uh, then you have to see Venice the day after the closure of the Biennale. And, 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 and these cities, uh, you know, have, and, you know, they are kind of trapped, in a sense, in this kind of momentary um, and exp of, you know, exponential growth of visibility that then become immediately deflated. But what I'm arguing is not that the centers and peripheries have disappeared, but there is a fundamental shift. And this fundamental shift has to also do with the shift in the market. In the 90s, it would be biennales and exhibitions produce, you know, cultural capital. And this cultural capital was the currency that small places around the world could use to trade in the you know, bigger market. But in the last decade, I, let me just simply say that the, this may have, and I'm very careful to periodize it, but if you look at the 2003 Venice Biennale organized by Francesco Bonami, it strikes me that this was really the tail end of this because this was the, led to the massive expansion of the art market. The sleepy Art Basel became global by having art, you know, art Basel Miami, Freeze Art Fair was created. Then, you know, so if you just sort of look at these circuits, it's very interesting. So there's been an enormous transfer of that cultural capital that's been now transformed into the surplus value that the market kind of represents. And so, but this shift in the market is a recognition also of the mobility of capital. You know, so you have to, you, know, you can't stay in Basel alone. You have to have at Basel Hong Kong, at Basel you know, Miami, you know, Freeze New York, Freeze Masters, Free, you know, so, you know, uh, FIAC Los Angeles. So it's a recognition, in a sense, that centers alone are not enough to sustain these practices. And the, you know, the organizations that did not adapt to this change of the deterritorialization of the center and now I you know have either paid the price. I mean, look at many museums, you know, today. So what I'm arguing is not the fact that there's been a disappearance of center, but there is less emphasis on the idea that there is a center in this sense, and that's why I say there are off centers. There are off centers that are predicated on the existence of a number of things. It's not just simply a network the existence of a certain density of cultural capital on one hand, a certain density of economic power on the other hand. So um, these move in, in all these different nodes. I think that's the way I would sort of to want us to reflect on it because this liquidation, this, you know, if you, if you look in the field I work in, which is the nonprofit field, at a at, at the very moment in which the art world is really drowning in money, it's very difficult for public institutions to find funding. I mean, I think this is a kind of paradox, and a paradox rich in irony, you know, <laughs> in many ways. Вы достаточно много сегодня говорили о десятой документе, который делал Катрин Давид. Я ее хорошо помню. И одним из ее, так сказать, особенностей, насколько я помню, было то, что Катрин Давид использовала 
ту энергию, которая появилась именно в 90-е, это то, что называется новая форма коммуникации или тактические медиа, когда в течение всей документы здание «Оранжери» было отдано на откуп художникам, работающим в этом направлении. И более того, она даже пригласила нескольких медийных художников, собственно, показать свои работы там, что было немножко странно, потому что до этого э, э, все медийное сообщество, собственно, э, было ра рада тому, что вот наконец-таки пришла новая форма надгосударственной коммуникации, когда можно работать и э, коммуницировать непосредственно, да, убирая всех посредников. А через какое-то время прошло там еще десятилетие, оказалось, что... И вроде бы это было то же самое, о чем вы говорите, да, вот как бы такая глобальность через медийность. Но прошло какое-то время, оказалось, что в этом тоже есть определенная иллюзия. И более того, все те художники, которые радостно говорили, что мне не надо музей и не надо, не надо никакую институцию, потому что моя работа есть в сети, и с ней можно взаимодействовать, как-то постепенно склонились к тому, ну, хорошо, что, хорошо, что она есть в сети, но, но лучше бы, чтобы этот компьютер стоял в музее. И как бы вот опять вот эта вот иллюзия, иллюзия такой вот возможной общественности, она опять разрушилась. То есть мы опять, а вы снова обращаетесь к какой-то форме такой вот глобализации. Да, вот как, как это завести? How to answer this? Well, <laughs> um, I would actually argue that Catherine David's documenta in 1997 remains one of the most significant exhibitions of the last 30 years that I know. And, and I, don't, I don't say this lightly. And the exhibition also anticipated many things because we tend to forget the program of 100 Days, 100 Guests, which was every single day, there was a guest, philosophers, architects, sociologists, activists, artists, writers, filmmakers, you know, in a sense. It, it was um, a kind of a parliament of various forms, if you will. And that was also broadcast on the internet. I mean, we're talking about 97, of course. Um, you know, not many people could participate, but I think it was really an attempt to, to cross that gray zone between, you know, the affective, which is the physical space of the exhibition, and the virtual to bridge that relationship between the affective and the virtual. And uh, it, the tactical media uh, you know, you know, platforms where Kaim Mensch is illegal and so on, I still remember. I, I, I can almost recall just about every room in the exhibition because it was that concise and powerful. If you go to the Kultur Bahnhof, on top is... Pistoletos, all the Ogeti Menos, the minor subjects, and underneath immediately is Elioite Sika. Uh, I mean, just that vision of horizontality between the two artists tagged on top of each other in this kind of vertical stuff was a curatorial, you know, deft curatorial move, beautiful. And also, it was David who, through this exhibition, returned us to, you know, the, what Paolo Heckenhoff will take up in Pasapalo Biennale in 1998, um, which was under the auspices of uh, anthropophagia. And that was the importance of Brazilian artists of the 50s and 60s, Elio Tisica, Ligia Clark, and all the rest of them. And so what I think that is really important to think about in terms of this relationship between the, you know, the, 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 the local and the global, the digital and the non-digital, is this you know, relationship that the exhibition tried to explore between the affective and the virtual. And I think that was really, but without any kind of technophilia, it was not, a, you know, it was not filled with gizmos and gadgets and so on. 
you know, you walk through this transparent bookshop by Vito Aconci into this, you know, space by Franz Vest and of course the stage, you know, Mike Kelly, all these different people in the exhibition. And I thought that she was really pointing to something that was really, that became, you know, part of the toolbox of curators in the 2000s. And that is the exhibition space as a kind of social space, a social, cultural, intellectual space. And what I believe that David tried to do was really to create that possibility of maybe not completely abrogating the, the, the boundary between you know, different you know, techniques, but at least introducing something that changed the reflection of the time of the exhibition. So 100 Days, 100 Guests, of course, took off from Arnold Bode's uh, notion of documenta as a museum of 100 days. And of course, a reflection on the, you know, of Joseph Boyce's 1,000 Oaks, you know, in, um, and the reflection on, you know, um, you know, Boyce's, you know, work from 72 in documenta. So there are all these different relationships. And, and I think that Wondrous, Wondrous, Wondrous Days, Wondrous Guests was a very important instant of trying to really make, use the exhibition as a kind of broadcasting stage, you know, beyond the physical borders of the exhibition. I don't know if this answers your question, but I think that in exhibitions, we must always try, you know, in, you know, we must always try to use the form or to exploit the form. The form has, you know, uh, an incredible amount of possibilities to it beyond what we just simply do in the space itself. We have to figure out ways to exploit the, the exhibition form, you know, as um, a, a kind of a tool um, to use as a kind of GPS of, of an, a laboratory of thinking. Добрый вечер. У меня вопрос по поводу Венецианской биеннале. Пережила ли Венецианская биеннале свое обновление все-таки? Была ли эта точка отсчета, которая она пришла как на станции, конечной и оторвалась и пошла в новый путь с новой формой и новой дорогой? И этот путь будет с остановками постоянными или это будет экспресс, который будет идти насквозь с какой-то новой темой и новой формой? И будет это более экспериментальная платформа или все-таки более консервативная? Well, only time will tell. You know, whenever I go to exhibitions, I don't. I try very much not to um, rush to judgment. I always say, give it time. I can no more anticipate whether this is going to be conservative or experimental uh, than I can tell you um, whether it's going to be uh, uh, an inter you know, a good exhibition. But I think it, you know, it, it has a number of things that, that I want to explore. I want to um, use the exhibition form to, to explore. You know, one of which is um, orality and the concept of the song, you know, to think about the voice um, as one element that may sort of create, um, you know, another texture in the body of the, of the show. So and that's the, the extent to which I can answer your question at this particular time. It's still information, it's still being built um, as a network of things, you know, connected. Um, but we'll see. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much. Probably there are no more questions. So thank you very much for for your for this talk today. Thank you very much for coming. Спасибо большое всем, что пришли. Thank you, Marsha.